I've been working on this project with some friends from, uh, well, I guess we've known each other from the local Dorkbot group, and but also have gone to Tour Camp a bunch. Uh, if you're not familiar with Tour Camp, it's a camp in uh, the um, pretty much the northwestern corner of the United States uh, every two years. So it trades off between Dutch and German camps and it's pretty epic and um, looking forward to doing another one next year hopefully if uh, the whole virus thing cooperates but um, in prior tour camps there have been phone networks run in the camp so you could um, I think pretty much every camp since 2012 you've been able to get a phone line into your tent and then be able to make calls around and do fun stuff with the phones um, there was a one occasion where somebody ran a GSM network and you were able to text back and forth amongst other people in the camp and there was lots of fun around that. I heard that um, somebody named Nick Farr had crabs um, that came came over the phone. <laughs> um, and more recently, um, we've um, the group my group of folks tried to run a BBS at the uh, 2018 tour camp. Uh, didn't go over very well. We weren't all that well prepared, and we certainly didn't market it very well. And so, uh, I don't know, how many users did we get? Like one, <laughs> two? So we're going to try and do better this time around. Um, one of the things that we've been toying around with is getting an entire um, Time Division multiplexed phone system working. Um, it's basically a really cheap way to get a ton of phone lines available so that we can have as many subscribers as possible. Um, ordinarily, if you wanted to run a phone system like, like um, ShadyTel, the, the organization that has been at Tour Camp prior years, they usually rely on um, like private branch, ex branch exchange equipment to provide a ton of phone lines to the people in the camp. And it works pretty well. Um, but some people had ideas about how to get even more phone lines and maybe have more fun with them by basically building our own T1 time division multiplexed phone system where we've got trunks of 24 lines and multiple trunks and can serve maybe 100, 200 people um, at a time which would be amazing. Um, it'd be a great problem to run out of phone lines. I don't think that's going to happen even at a camp with several hundred people. Uh, usually the number of people who actually want to play with phones is fairly small relative to the entire camp. But hopefully we can make it interesting enough that uh, we can get a ton of subscribers. So uh, we still want to run a BBS too, which of course means we need lots of modems. Um, and uh, obviously, I mean, buying modems these days isn't all that hard to do. Um, but you're still going to wind up spending a fair amount of money on eBay or maybe having to luck into somebody having an enormous batch of modems that they're just trashing and are willing to give you for free. Um, so that's kind of dependent on having luck and being in the right place at the right time. But on top of that, then you've got 20, 30, 40, 50 modems, potentially, if you want a really big modem pool. And you've got to figure out how to power them all and where to put them all when you're going to camp. Um, and so I was hoping on top of this whole T1 phone system, we might be able to produce virtualized modems using, taking advantage of some soft modem. Uh, so 20 years ago, the, there was an effort to make cheaper and cheaper and cheaper modems by moving more and more of the functionality of the modulation and demodulation out of the hardware and into the software on the PC. It's very much the same thing that happened with audio synthesis. Like, you know, 25 years ago, you'd buy a sound card and it would have a hardware synthesizer on it because uh, that was the only feasible way to get decent sound quality. The computers of the day weren't fast enough to synthesize audio with a decent quality. But uh, eventually computers got faster and faster and faster and took over a lot of that synthesis responsibility from custom hardware synthesizers. So same thing here with modems. Um, these wind modems or soft modems came along and to various degrees replaced the hardware with software that ran under Windows or Mac OS or Linux or whatever. Um, and some of those libraries that do all the signal processing for the modems 
are still around uh, and can be compiled on Linux without necessarily having to depend on the hardware. Uh, and Supersat, who is one of the people involved with um, ShadyTel, the telephone company that has been at Tour Camp in prior years, pointed out, um, I don't know, a few months ago that there were some interesting soft modems, uh, soft modem suites just sitting around on the internet still uh, available for us to kind of pick apart and maybe see if we can't wrap them somehow in our hardware instead of relying on uh, these wind modems and having to plug them into a whole bunch of them into a computer over USB or PCI, which would suck. So um, let me switch cameras here. Do, do, do. Oh, video's choppy, no chop. Mm. Sorry, looking at the chat here. I uh, was kind of hoping Supersat might come along, but uh, nope, not yet. Uh, might have better things to do, I suppose. Um, let's go to the computer. Oh, with the computer, with the computer. There we go, that's better. Okay, so first of all, actually, you know, let me talk about the hardware that I'm building because um, I'm not necessarily putting things in the right order here. Uh, let's go to the table. There's the table and let me put myself on there. Okay, so what you see here is uh, roughly, I don't know, 2000 era uh, T1 E1 tester. And so it's capable of doing all sorts of line emulations, simulating T1 lines for voice, for data, doing uh, bit error test patterns and all sorts of stuff. And um, wonderfully, you can get these for really cheap on eBay because practically nobody, at least in the Western world, um, I don't know about other places, seems to care about T1 or E1 lines anymore. So I picked this thing up for, I don't know, 25 bucks, I think. Uh, and it works just fine. Um, but I can plug in a real T1 line. Uh, I'll tip, maybe try and tip the camera up a bit here. Yeah, so you can see the top of it. And I've got uh, a tip and a ring cable that loop over to a punch down block that then goes into one of these cables and goes through um, some line interface transformer and line protection to take that T1 line into uh, a chip here, which is a framer and line interface unit chip made by, I want to say XR, but I don't think that's right. I think it used to be XR, but I think now the company is called Max Linear. I think one bought the other. Uh, and then, of course, because practically everything I do has to have an FPGA in it, there is a Lattice ECP5 FPGA. And then there's a whole bunch of hardware uh, or a whole bunch of power supply stuff. I've got, I don't know, three switching power supplies and some linear regulators, uh, an FTDI chip, which provides the JTAG interface to program the ECP5. And then really small here. I should probably zoom in. Too lazy. Uh, yes. Okay. Yay, we've overcome our laziness. Okay. So yeah, FPGA, the FTDI chip, and then this little guy here is a ULPI USB physical interface. So what it does is it converts the, the differential pair, the DPDM signals of, of USB 2.0 into a, a parallel interface that goes into the FPGA. And then on the FPGA, I'm using the um, Kate Temkin Great Sky Gadgets uh, Luna project, which is a really elegantly implemented USB framework and it, honestly working with it has been amazing because I've, I've done USB stuff before in an FPGA and it's like pulling teeth but I think when I got to, up to speed with Luna uh, it literally took me a couple hours before I had something that was not only enumerating on the USB but also actually transferring useful data so that was super exciting uh, doo -doo -doo, back out again okay so Essentially, because this line interface unit has got eight T1 interfaces on it, each T1 interface is capable of operating 24 phone lines. And if you multiply that out, that's 192 phone lines, potentially, that we can control using this board. Uh, and the plan for Tour Camp is to use one of these, um, let me show you, one of these ADITs. Uh, it's this box over here in the corner, this guy. I'm not using it right now because 
to demonstrate stuff. It's not really that important. Um, but it, each one of these um, slots, there's six of them, has eight channels worth of analog phone lines. And then it's got two T1 ports on the back. And we can plug that into two of the lines on this board I'm working on. And now we've got, uh, let's see, doing math, six times eight, 48. 48 analog phone lines that we can use. Um, and you can buy those edits for fairly cheap on eBay as well. So, you know, for a few hundred dollars, we can basically build a ridiculous number of analog phone lines and take them to camp and they'll not even take up all that much space. So this feels like a pretty good architecture. And uh, where's Twitch chat? Make sure I'm not missing out on anything interesting that I should talk about. So I'm totally going to forget. Um, yeah, okay, so back to the computer, and let me show you what uh, me and Supersat discovered earlier today. Um, he pointed out that there is this SL modem project out there. We were earlier looking at a different project that had a lot more kernel module hardware dependencies and stuff like that, and I played around with it for a while and got like a Ubuntu distribution from 2006 and installed that in a virtual machine and messed around with it a bunch and didn't really get very far with it. Um, it was just kind of really fragile and I gave up after a while. And then, I don't know, a few weeks ago, he pointed out uh, SL modem, which is a similar sort of wind modem um, technology that seems to be far more well separated from the hardware. So you wind up with this um, basically this DSP binary that contains all of the signal processing for the actual modem implementation. And then it gets wrapped by open source code in C that does all of the, um, you know, sort of management of Linux PTYs and moving data back and forth between them. Um, it's also SL modem is designed to take advantage of just standard audio protocol or APIs. So you can actually point it at a device that is an AC97 audio codec or anything that I guess is also mo um, also sound supported and it will pipe audio, modem audio in and out through that. So the, the interfaces to this modem DSP library seem to be really tidy and well-contained and hopefully we can make them do what we want to fairly easily. So let me um, actually show you what I did earlier today. So I've got this SL modem stuff and, oops, that's right. I just do make uh, modem test, I think it was. No? Oh, <laughs> uh, there's a subdirectory I need to be in. Yeah, modem, make modem test. Uh, did I not install my Linux headers? That'd be kind of ridiculous. This worked on my other laptop. Uh, I, can't, I can never remember which exact package I'm supposed to be using to install headers and stuff. Somebody in chat will know. Or maybe that there's too much latency. Linux headers, okay. Let's do that. Come on, I've compiled C on this thing before, haven't I? How is it even possible that this is still necessary after... Uh, ugh. Hang on, let me make sure I saw what I was doing. Sysc defs. Yeah, that's like just. Do I have TCC? Yeah? Okay. Just Linux headers, huh? Oh, I should explicitly select one to install. Look at all that garbage. Um, I guess the generic one for the kernel I'm running now, which I think is dash 80. I feel like this shouldn't be necessary. <laughs> okay. Well, now we get to watch just how much I suck at writing C anymore, now that I've been using pretty much everything else. 
Um, crap. Isn't there like a build essential? Yeah. And there's nothing to install there. Yeah. Help me. So, what am I missing if I'm just missing sys c defs? This is why I like to prepare, because then I waste a whole bunch of time people watching me do silly stuff like this. Uh, it's going to be the dumbest thing. I know it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Fuck, fuck her off. Oh, uh, because it... No. Move C6 dev. It's already installed. Is this an i386 thing? Oh, it looks like maybe Peter's already kind of onto that. Yep. Mm. Garbage. Yep, that's a whole lot of not not already installed stuff. Do do do. Is the stream holding up? It was, it's been pretty erratic earlier today. Like I'll wind up, you know, just loading a web page and the images won't load or some stupid crap like that. Hey, there we go. All right, so now when I run this, let's just do this. So I don't forget to build if I start messing with it. So what this does is it creates two PTS devices. And if I create uh, two terminals, and yep, and just want to be really unsophisticated and just do screen. Of using a <laughs> so can you tell this is a computer that I've been trying to keep clean for streaming and obviously haven't done a whole lot of stuff on yet? Hey, Supersat. We was talking about you. Yeah, so this is basically what I was doing earlier today. And so now I've connected to these two PTSs. And... I don't remember. Yeah, so I can tell it to hang up. I can tell it not to care about dial tones because what I'm so I should probably explain what modem test actually does. So in this package of code that's basically someone wrapping or updating uh, this SL modem library from 2003 or whenever it was when so there was a commercial commercial company called SmartLink, I think it was, that produced this DSP library and licensed it to soft modem vendors. And at some point they made a Linux wrapper for it. And in the years since they stopped caring about it and stopped offering it as a product, um, people in the Linux community have sort of carried it on. And uh, Supersat sent me a link to this GitHub project that has the, all the code um, and I guess to some extent updated um, as far as it can be updated. And so I pulled it and we were both poking around at it earlier today trying to see what kinds of things we could hook into so that we might be able to hook these soft modems up to the T1 channels that I'm getting up from my hardware. And I saw this modem test program that was already in the project, compiled it, and from what I could tell from the code, it looked like it created two instances of a soft modem and then basically just connected the data pumps or the basically the, the code that generates or consumes audio samples from the telephone line. And so I kind of looked at this and thought, if I run this and it creates two PTYs that basically act like modems as far as, you know, like Hayes AT command set, um, 
and I connect to those PTYs, I'll have things that act like modems. And sure enough, these things act like modems. Now, I tried to get them to connect, and because there's no simulation of... Oh, I'll try to fix this bug. <laughs> yeah, so previously when I did this dialing stuff, um, it wouldn't detect a dial tone because it's not being done in the simulation. Um, all it's doing is it's basically plugging two modems directly to each other virtually, and there's no phone system producing dial tone, um, producing rings, any of that stuff. So when I first started playing around with it, I tried to dial one to the other, and it would immediately say, no, um, not no carrier, but... Um, no dial tone? No dial tone. Yeah, it would say no dial tone. Uh, and then if I tried to answer, it would immediately say no carrier. And I quickly figured out from the source code that all this stuff is doing is running in a tight loop and there's no sense of actual wall clock time. And so if you're sitting here basically managing two modems at once and you tell one to answer the phone while the other one's trying to generate a carrier, unless you time it just perfectly, these things are running at... a far faster than uh, real time. So they're running, I don't know, 10, 100 times as fast. And so there's no way you have enough time to tell one modem to connect and the other one to answer without one or, the, one or both of them timing out. So I added into the loop uh, a delay of 10 milliseconds each, each time through. So it kind of created something that vaguely seems like real time progress. Uh, so you have enough time to switch between the two modems and tell one to dial and one to answer. Oops, and that didn't work. UTD. Now that I fixed that, you can see when one phone dials and one, or sorry, one modem dials and one modem answers, you can see there's an actual negotiation that takes place here, including somewhere here. I was seeing a baud, or um, now this may not be the baud rate. For a while, I thought it might, it might be the baud rate, but this might be like a process number or a pointer or something. But the modems actually negotiate between them. And these are, this is purely in software. These are two modems that don't exist physically anywhere. Um, they're just run through this .o file that was produced by this company SmartLink uh, for their soft modems and which we've just kind of stuck together in software and made talk to each other. And they work. So the next thing I want to do is basically make all the calls that are in this test project uh, except instead make the TDM board, the, the T1, E1 interface, use that as the source for audio samples going into the modem and the sync for audio samples coming out of the modem software so that when I pick up a phone that's actually plugged into one of the analog phone lines on one of these T1 lines, I'll actually hear a modem. And then, of course, after that, I'll get out a real modem and try and negotiate between a real modem and one of these soft modems. So, I don't know, this, this has got me a bit excited. Uh, let me check on chat here. Oh, subtitles, yeah. <laughs> uh, if I had done what you did, Esden, and used um, OBS, OBS, then I would be able to do that more easily. But I chose the hardware route, and I don't know if I can inject captions of any sort easily. Uh, uh oh, what happened to Supersats hanging out with <laughs> Shady Tell? Yep, well, there goes that phone company. Yeah, so it's a binary blob. Let me get back over here and we'll look in the, the directory. Uh, if I do make clean, you'll notice there's still a, a .o file, and it's dspLibs.o. Uh, Supersat noticed earlier today that there's tons and tons of symbols in there. So, let's see, what is it? Objump, dump, dump, dash, T? Yeah. So, they, they didn't really strip it, um, which is very helpful. And we can see a lot of it's written in C++, uh, a lot of the, the name mangling that I recognize from C++ code. Um, there's a lot of... I don't know, I, th I think when, when there's no address associated with a particular symbol, doesn't that mean that it's a constant I'm trying to remember it's it's been a while since I've done C C++ stuff so I'm starting to 
lose my skills. Um, yeah, but you know, there's tables labeled and everything. Like, <laughs> this is very handy. Yeah, I really hope the virus gets straightened out because um, tour camp needs to happen. <laughs> I've got so much pent up energy. It's been it's been three years now, and it'll be four years when it happens next year, if it of course happens. So yeah, um, and I've put this project off for way too long. Um, I haven't really worked on it in earnest for several months now. But when I was working on it, let's go back over to some of the stuff that I did. Um, so pretty much what it boils down to is this, no, not that, not that, framer, boss. It's been a while since I've looked at this stuff, so it's, I'm kind of having to remind myself what all I did. Um, but honestly, there's not a ton of code. Um, this is in my gen code, which is also what Luna's written in, and so I figured I would try learning in my gen. But basically what this particular file does is it describes the signals that go t into the framer chip that are used to control it, so to configure it. So there's an address, there's an address bus and a data bus, and then you kind of access it like static RAM. And there's a whole lot of registers. In fact, I think the register space is something like 64K, although it's not completely populated. Uh, oh, signal 15, okay, 32K. Um, and then I used Luna, well, okay, so this is, this is the code that basically jiggles the signals on the address and data bus in order to read or write to those configuration registers. And this is how I configure each of the spans to be T1 or E1 and exactly what their behavior is and how they're terminated and all this stuff. Uh, it's also how you read status on each of the, the spans and each of the individual channels in a T1 span. So um, that's kind of what's going on here. And then I've got a test, which is something you can actually run that's another. That's a cool thing about in my gen is that um, writing tests is done in Python and can be run purely within Python. You don't have to go and bust out to you know some other tool in order to run tests, which is nice doing HDL stuff because ordinarily that's not how it works. Um, oh, I think some of the stuff I need to delete because I'm no longer using it. Um, Sacrus. Yeah, this is a, basically a patch I did. So with USB, there's several different ways in which you can transfer data. And the most common way is bulk transfers. And that's the sort of thing that um, a hard drive uses when you're doing mass storage transfers and reading and writing to a hard drive. Um, bulk transfers are basically best effort, um, but there's no real guarantee exactly how quickly they'll go through. Um, but for reading and writing from a hard drive, that's no big deal. Um, it just sends it down and when it gets gets there it gets there um, there's also uh, isochronous transfers which are designed specifically to carve out a certain amount of bandwidth over the USB channel um, and dedicate it to your particular device and historically that's been designed for things like video and audio streaming where you need you know you're gonna need to transfer two megabytes a second or two megabits a second whatever and the USB controller on the host will actually carve out that much time and make sure that when you want to send something, as long as you don't try to send more data than you said you would, that there will be uh, time slots available to move that data from between between the devices. So um, it apparently didn't work very well in the first few years of USB, but has become much, much better and kind of preferable if you're building something where you need, you know you need to transfer a certain amount of data every second. And this T1 interface is definitely, definitely fits that use case. Uh, so if we have 192 spans, or sorry, 192 voice channels on this interface, which we do, uh, each of them goes bi-directional. So, and each one of them is 64 kilobits uh, per second. So if you multiply that out, uh, 192 channels times 8 
thousand samples per second times eight bits, so sixteen or sixty-four kilobits a second. That's twelve point three megabits per second in each direction because you've got audio going out the T1 interface uh, and then in the T1 interfaces. So with USB to high speed, that's plenty, uh, or we're going to have plenty of bandwidth. Um, but even so, I decided to give these the um, ISO transfer method in USB a try because I really don't want frame slips, um, which is basically losing or having to repeat a sample on the T1 interface uh, on an individual voice channel because you either dropped it because USB was acting up or because um, the clocks between the device transmitting the audio and the device receiving the audio are somehow different uh, and not running at the same speed. Um, so when you have a frame slip, you wind up either dropping a sample or repeating a sample, which causes a small distortion in the audio. And for voice purposes, if you're just talking to somebody on the phone, it's no big deal. Um, you know, you might, if you're really listening carefully, you might hear a little click every once in a while, but it'd be really tiny. You know, I, I don't know that I've ever heard a frame slip, but if you've got a modem connected to another modem and frame slips keep happening, that can significantly erode the data transfer rate uh, between two modems. Um, so undesirable, and I'm hoping that we can avoid, avoid that completely so that if people at tour camp, for example, want to be able to connect at 56K or 33.6, probably more realistically for reasons I won't go into right now, uh, it'll be a reliable connection because we aren't slipping frames. Um, back to scrolling through the code. Yeah, this is um, basically the Luna USB li uh, framework didn't really have a fully functioning isochronous USB ISO uh, handler in it. And so I went and touched up a few things. I should probably look and see if I can commit this back into the upstream Luna repo. Because uh, I'm sure other, I think I, I saw at least one other person in uh, the one bit squared discord looking to do ISO transfers. And if I had contributed this, they might be using it right now uh, instead of probably reproducing the work that I did. So yeah, uh, commit early and often, unlike what I do. Um, yeah, continuing to scroll through here, I, I'm looking for the real meat of it. So oh, this is OK, so this is where you define your hardware, like all the different pins on the FPGA and how they're hooked up to that hardware on the particular board you've designed. Um, and that's working nicely. But where is the meat? It's not in there. Test? No. <laughs> Uh, I haven't looked at this stuff in too long. Drat. Oh well. Uh, but in any case, I also built a Python tool that does a bunch of different stuff. Mostly it's debugging at this point. It's just to be able to go into the registers on the framer chip and reconfigure how it's operating. Um, I have spent a bunch of time just trying to figure out how to get uh, a stable connection going and how to manage the clocks between the different interfaces so that if you had multiple T1 lines plugged in, um, they wouldn't all be running on their own clocks, but instead would sync to uh, one particular T1 interface so that we can avoid the whole frame slip thing. I wish I knew where that code was. It's in here somewhere. Gateware, framer, no. You know, I can, I can search for this. Let me think of what, uh, it's going to be somewhere where there's a FIFO because we want it. No, not JSON. No, there's too many FIFOs in this project, I guess. Um, uh, isochronous.cpp? No, I don't think that's it. <laughs> oh, well, I hope I didn't delete the file. Nah. Impossible. Oh. Yeah, this is, this is it, isn't it? Yeah, okay, this is the top level file in the project, which is not named .py because you can execute it as a command from within this 
poetry package manager for Python that uh, was used by the Luna project, and I thought I'd give it a try. So, yeah, where is that? Uh, I have an example of how to use it here, uh, and completely forgot this is actually a Python program that contains the top-level hardware description language for the project. It does all of the basically talking over USB and moving data in and out of the framer chip as it's coming in and out via the T1 interfaces. So yeah, um, let's look. Yeah, so this is basically describes how the device comes up on the USB when it's enumerated. Um, pretty much copied verbatim from the Luna projects, uh, the example. And then here's the top level FPGA code that adds some of the standard USB handlers. And then I uh, create basically a bunch of shift registers, I think one for each channel that take bits into or out of the framer chip. And then once I've got a full frame, I stuff that into a FIFO that is connected to the USB part of the, that's implemented by Luna. And that moves these frames of data in and out over USB. So, but I mean, there's not much to it. Like the, the meat of the project is pretty much, you know, this is all sort of boilerplate USB descriptor stuff which um, looks pretty much the same from project to project, except, you know, in my case, I'm using ISO endpoints, the isochronous endpoints, and describing how large a packet size and how many transfers per USB frame I want to do, blah, blah, blah. But the rest of it is really pretty simple. It's just taking data from here and moving it over there, and taking data from there and moving it over here. Uh, there's a little bit of clock distribution, as I said earlier, because I don't want to slip frames, I elect one of the T1 interfaces to be the source cl clock. And that clock is then distributed to all the other interfaces and all those other interfaces will use that clock to transfer data. And so now everything is in lockstep. And I imagine when we get to Tour Camp, we're probably going to use uh, Shady Tell's T1 line as our source clock. And then we'll just wind up being in sync with them and then if they're, there, there is a provision in the framer chip that if their interface goes down for some reason, if they stop, if they get disconnected or whatever happens, uh, you can switch over to using your own internal clock until that source clock comes back up again. Um, yeah, I don't know if I'm going to dig into trying to splice the... Uh, I just don't remember enough about this code. <laughs> uh, I, I should have spent some time reading over it, um, so I don't feel quite prepared to just dig in and start splicing the SL modem stuff into the project. But when I do, it is going to be in this ISO test CPP project, uh, which is basically just a single C++ file, which honestly, I think is just C. Yeah. But this runs on Linux, and it is on the other side of the USB cable from the, the T1 interface board. And all it does is, uh, yeah, if you look through the code, we, we enter main here, and I'm opening up uh, an episode of Hell's Bells, which is a radio program I remember listening to back in the early days of the internet when downloading a 10 megabyte file was a big deal because it was like a quarter of my hard drive. Um, but it was in code when I downloaded it, I got it off the internet from, I think, whoever actually produced the show and it was encoded in the same audio encoding that phone systems use the mu law logarithmic encoding. And so I have these AU files, which basically are in exactly the same format that I need to produce samples that go out over a T1 voice channel to be able to pick up the phone and actually hear the audio from the program. So this program opens this audio file, um, and it also looks like it just writes a, a file for whatever's coming back from the other end of the phone line. Uh, initializes USB, opens the device with the vendor ID and, and product ID I gave it, claims the interface, switches it into um, an active um, setting, it, just a USB detail that's not really that interesting to talk about. Allocates a bunch of transfers so that I've got a whole bunch of transfers queued up. Um, and then basically just drop them in 
and start handling events in a in a loop and this will just block until an event comes in and then that whatever event comes in gets dispatched i think where's the callback when you when you add a transfer to through libusb you wind up giving it a callback yeah that's right yeah so we've got these functions that get called back whenever a transfer is completed and if we scroll up we'll see we've got an iso in so this is basically audio coming from iso in means from device to host my memory serves um, and i just go and pick apart some oh yeah yeah this is this is debug code this isn't even doing anything at the moment but when I was testing it, I was sending frames that basically contained a bunch of counters in it instead of audio data so that I could watch and make sure that the counters were incrementally inc incrementing correctly and not missing, skipping, uh, which would indicate a frame slip. So that's what this debug code was doing. But that's not actually doing anything because it's set to false. And instead, I'm just taking the frames that I get and writing them to a file. Uh, vice versa, when I get an ISO out callback, which means there's a free buffer that is ready to go out from the USB host, the laptop, or my Linux system, to the T1 interface, um, I go and configure that transfer um, using some blah 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 here, um, but basically read another chunk of the, from the file into the buffer and send it on its way via libusb submit transfer, and away it goes. And when I tested this, um, it was remarkably stable. Like I would go and do a bunch of CPU intensive stuff on my computer and wouldn't miss a sample. So uh, USB stacks have really evolved a lot in the last 20 something years that, you, I guess 25 years that USB has been a thing, which is good because you'd think they'd have it sorted out in 25 years. Um, so I've been neglecting chat. Maybe I should look and see what's going on. Uh, doo -doo. IPv4 dial-up internets. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm hoping to kind of keep it more 80s, like have some du have direct. Um, yeah. So my vision for tour camp. Uh, I don't know. I, I kind of enjoyed modeming more in the 80s than the 90s because by the 90s I got to college, and very quickly found myself in a dorm that took it upon ourselves. So. Uh, story time. Okay, so at Oregon State University, there is this dorm, or at least there was a dorm called Weatherford Hall, and it was a fire trap. It was built in 1927 or 1928, and it was said that if the building caught fire, it would basically burn to the ground in about 10 minutes. Uh, I don't know how true that really would, have, would be, but fine. Uh, it did have a very elaborate fire system built into it, which they tested frequently. Like every few months, um, you know, probably at least once a term, they would set that thing off at usually like 3 a.m. 3 a.m. Um, and we would all march outside and wait for the all clear and then go back in and go back to sleep. So this hall, this, this dorm hall, dormitory, um, because it was pretty much the oldest dorm on campus and it was really dilapidated and a fire hazard, they pretty much let students do whatever they wanted. So no problem building your own loft, painting the doors, painting the walls, whatever. Um, people would even do like art projects on the, their doors, sometimes putting holes in their doors, whatever. Um, so it was really cool. Um, but one of the things you did when you wanted to move in was you would actually apply to live in the dorm and you would fill out this questionnaire that the guy who ran the front desk would then go through and he would start kind of clustering people together. And I wound up being clustered with all of the computer nerds uh, on the first floor East Wing. And I think within a year of being there, we'd all hatched a scheme to basically get our own T1, uh, T1 line just for our floor. And pro several of the people on my floor worked for the campus IT group. And so they had all the access they ne needed and knew everyone they needed to know. And it got done. And, you know, in 1992, I had 1.5 megabits into my dorm room. And I didn't need modems anymore because uh, I was, you know, flying along at 1.5 megabits instead of, you know, 33.6 kilobits if I, on a good day. So that was cool. Um, 
so my modeming to a great extent was more about calling BBSs as a kid um, and downloading lots of stuff. You can imagine what kinds of stuff I might be downloading uh, in the late 80s as a teenager. Um, and that was fun. And, you know, also chatting with friends late at night when, you know, making a voice call would just wake everybody in your house up. Being able to just type quietly and chat with people uh, was also kind of cool. Um, I didn't really get into games much, but I know there were a ton of text-based games. And so I think uh, us BBS nerds for Tour Camp want to in, at least recreate that, if not other things too. But that's kind of my focus, is to have a lot of these sort of earlier pre-internet experiences. Um, being able to dial in and play door games and multi-user games. Um, and then there have been some interesting efforts around recreating uh, dial-up online services like Prodigy. Someone apparently, I think it was Prodigy, or maybe it was, you know, I think it was Prodigy, and I think someone else reverse engineered another online service so that you could basically re run that service on modern-day hardware um, and use the old clients from the early the late 80s early 90s to connect via modem over it so you know stuff like prodigy um that'd be kind of fun although i'm i don't know if unless we had some way to populate an entire prodigy system it, it would be all that in, interesting other you know just dialing into prodigy and then seeing that there's nothing there would be kind of boring so we'll have to figure that one out but uh yeah that's that's kind of what i'm after is the sort of old slow pre-internet bbs stuff um, doo -doo -doo. back to chat. Twang. What, as in, remind me what twang is? Uh, I'm trying to de abbreviate that or de. Uh, my vocabulary is pretty bad. I'm, I'm kind of tired. <laughs> And it's also hot on hot up here. Uh, we don't have proper air conditioning. Uh, that reminds me, I don't really need to have this thing turned on because I'm not using it. So, where's that switch? That's not it. I guess I can just pull the plug. And now you can listen to my chair squeak. Cool. Um, RTL wrapper, but uh. Yeah, that's that's a good idea. So I don't <laughs> I don't go hunting for like where's my top level HDL uh, and get confused because I think the TDM tool is not Python. So yeah, that's a good idea. I should do that. Um, oh yeah, encoding mu law is not that hard though. Um, I am actually very interested in mu law for other reasons. Um, there's a, let me switch back. I guess I'm yakking more and I don't really need to show the computer that much. There you go. You get to look at full screen me. Um, yeah, so another thing I'm interested in that happens to use Mula is old drum machines and old samplers from the 80s. So uh, things like the Lin LM1 and the Emu Emulator 2 used audio codecs from w using Mula. So basically like telephone system voice codecs to get pseudo 12-bit resolution, or dynamic range, I should say, without having to actually use 12 bits worth of data, because uh, EEPROMs in the early 80s were ex just extraordinarily expens expensive, and RAM was too, in the case of like an emulator 2, where you were able to load your own samples off of disk into RAM. So, you know, cutting your memory requirements by a third uh, was a great thing, and 12-bit nonlinear MULA encoded audio was the way they did it. So I've actually got uh, some decoders. It's a decoder, not an encoder, but um, a decoder that's implemented in Python as a way to implement the exact curve that the AM6070 used. Oh, no, I don't have the data sheet here. Yeah, the, the AM6070 is the chip that was used in a ton of old drum machines and samplers. Yeah, this guy. Doo -doo -doo. Internet is slow. Hello? Seriously. 
okay. Well, there's other 60, 70. Well, I don't know. It's just a data sheet. So I guess it's not too interesting. But um, do, do, do. when is the ASMR coming? <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. Y'all are weird. Um, I suppose once I start getting audio moving in and out of the phone system, then we'll be able to start playing with actual phones and hearing dial tone and DTMF and ringing and all that kind of good stuff. So soon, but not tonight. Um, I think because I'm pretty much broiling up, up here, um, second floor, no air conditioning, I think I'm going to call it for tonight and think about how I'm going to connect the soft modems into the the code that I'm running on the Linux system to get audio in and out of this thing. Uh, it shouldn't be too hard, but obviously, as you've seen tonight, I don't remember all that much about <laughs> what I was doing. Um, so I'll probably get a little bit of a head start on it, and then maybe, um, maybe well, I guess I'm busy t tomorrow night watching um, a movie, but maybe Friday night, hot times on a Friday night, uh, maybe get that soft modem spliced in here and get a, a real physical modem like like my courier this guy we all had one of these at some point right oh it's dusty needs more love uh yeah so i don't know maybe friday night we'll make that a goal of getting a soft modem hooked into the fpga t1 interface uh, moving audio back and forth, and then maybe try and dial this thing. Uh, I've also got a phone line simulator, so we should be able to simulate um, dial tone, ringing, that kind of stuff, and convince the T1 voice line that there's an actual phone system there. So, uh, yeah, we'll uh, do that Friday night. Why don't we? Uh, I might, might even schedule it on Twitch um, so that people know what to look forward to instead of me just sort of coming <laughs> coming out of nowhere and dropping a stream on them. So um, thank you all for joining me. Uh, I hope this was fun. Um, and let's, let's do more phone stuff. <laughs> Catch you later.